All righty, let's get started. Happy Monday, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our first CISCU webinar in quite some time. I'm excited to get kicked off again. Just for some introductions, I am Allison Portman. I'm a product manager here at Trimble in the MEP division. I thank you all for coming for this early Monday. I um, want to welcome my colleague, Matt Smith, who will be explaining scheduling within Revit focused on CISCU functionality. A little background on Matt, he began his career with TSI Building Data, and he joined the Trimble team when Cisco was acquired in 2016. He has spent significant time supporting, implementing, and training on Cisco, and I welcome him. Hopefully, some of you have all met him before as well. So before we begin, let's go through some housekeeping items. Uh, this will be recorded. Uh, you will receive a link to this recording after the event is through. You will be muted, but you can ask questions using the question section in your GoToWebinar bar on the right side of your screen. And if time permits, we will ask the questions and have Matt work through some of the answers. Um, we want you to have fun and um, enjoy this webinar. Additionally, I would like to solicit ideas for future webinars. If you want to put that in the chat on the right hand side, that would be awesome as well. So with that, as you can see, the agenda for this session is, first we're going to show you how to utilize the item level parameters. What are the schedules and how do you create them using those item level parameters? So with that, I will hand this off to Matt. Hey, good morning, everybody. So uh, what I wanted to do is start off kind of discussing um, some, some common things that I see on site of, of people not utilizing uh, some options that are available to you from a Cisco perspective. Um, so first of all, let's let's discuss the actual options that are available to you within Revit as far as parameter information. Um, so I've got a model here kind of already uh, dotted up with some pre-spooled uh, pipework, uh, multi-story. I've got some duct as well, and I've got some generic content. And uh, if time permits, hopefully get into uh, discussions for each avenue. So first and foremost, what you have at a baseline for parameter options are twofold. One, you have the ability to go to a project or a shared parameter. Um, and then you can do those two parameter types by either instance or type. So inside of your manage ribbon here, if I go to uh, project parameters, we can see that when Cisco has been introduced and uh, even just in a Revit model, uh, generically speaking, you will have some project parameters available to you. Now, these project parameters are issued, again, specifically to the project, whereas a shared parameter will exist um, at, at, throughout all versions of your project template. So you can carry a shared parameter through any version of uh, a Revit project, uh, so long as it's in your shared parameter file. Now, the primary difference between the two in my opinion, can be uh, kind of uh, simply, uh, simplified down to one objective. Does it need to be annotated? Does it need to be something that's on a construction document, a shop drawing? Uh, and if that is the case, something like size or system, uh, that would be a shared parameter. That is the kind of biggest uh, difference between the two. Um, a project parameter is something that cannot be annotated. It can be scheduled, it can be uh, shown as an instance property or a type property for a given model element, uh, but it cannot be tagged. So that is your primary difference. Um, <clears throat> to that point, we have the ability to uh, kind of build those things within our Cisco part list. So out of the box in most Cisco installations, what you'll see is that you've got just the part list in this given system with no real description other than when I hover my cursor to receive a tooltip option. Um, so on the back end here in our setup and process options, we have this little cogwheel called settings. And within there, what I can do is head to our other settings tab. And we have the ability to uh, imply an image description. So typically, most people are doing image with family name, but what I like to do is do image with description instance. As well, what I want to do for, here for my alternate description fields is set these to both, because as I issue either a description instance or a description type to any one of these fittings, or uh, later on we'll get into valves, I want to be able to see both options um, so that I can schedule either or. So when I hit apply and OK and close, You'll see now that my uh, icons have text following them. 
Now, natively right now, they are reporting out what the family, or in the case of my pipe, the type name is called. But if I go in and I right click and edit my pipe, for instance, one thing I'll see here at the bottom is two fields for description instance and description type. Now these are, like we were discussing earlier, um, the difference in the type and instance uh, per, uh, parameter options. An instance description is typically in Revit something that is on the properties palette, something that is uh, malleable, something that I can change without affecting all other versions in the project. So for instance, even in my properties palette currently, I have a 3D view selected and its discipline is set to mechanical. I could change this from mechanical discipline to say architectural or plumbing, and it would not uh, reflect any of my other 3D views in the project. So typically what I, I like to utilize here, <clears throat> specifically for pipe work for instance, is you'll notice that my type description here isn't that um, involved as it were. So it's not that descriptive. So if I'm trying to do an order or a purchasing list for vendor fulfillment, um, I don't know what type of pipe it is. I don't know if it's an A53 ERW grade B. I don't know if it's a schedule 40, schedule 80, uh, standard weight. Um, so my description instance and type, what I'm gonna go ahead and do here is just type in uh, an example. And I can copy and paste that in both fields. Okay, and go ahead and hit okay. And another option that we have available to us, we'll see here, now that I'm reporting uh, my description instance, I have A53 ERW grade B. Now where that actually comes into play onto our pipe work is if I scroll down, you'll see that since I already had pipe pre-modeled, my alternate description is currently blank. Now this is the instance version, so description instance. And if I hit edit type, I'll have alternate description two, which is also blank. So in order to apply that property palette to everything, I can select all of my objects in the model, including ductwork if I'd like. And there's an option here in the tool palette called apply system data. Now what that's gonna do is it's gonna go through the process of looking at all 429 elements and recognizing against the system that I have active, what does it need to apply as far as updating features for either the instance description or the type description. <clears throat> And so upon this uh, completion, we will be able to utilize that parameter instead of type. Uh, you could utilize this in the case of fittings. So if we're trying to provide a fabrication uh, schedule uh, at the end of the day for fittings, our guys in the shop don't necessarily need to know exactly uh, that it is a schedule, standard weight, 90 degree long radius elbow, butt weld by butt weld. Perhaps they would like to see uh, that it's just an LR90 and maybe the schedule. Uh, you could utilize the same thing there. So if we go edit that particular fitting, and we say LR90, and we'll say standard weight. And then OK. And I could be a bit more specific about my options here. I could go select a long radius in the job, select all instances in project, of which I have 12, and then again do that same option of apply system data. So now in both instances, if I look at my elbow here, I can see there in my alternate description, the instance parameter option is now reporting LR90 standard weight. And likewise, my pipe, if I scroll down, we've got A53 ERW grade B, schedule 40. Okay. Uh, one more thing that we'll do, and I don't see a lot of people utilizing, and I like it specifically for my accessories, um, is assigning project data information. So I've got some butterfly valves in the model. We can see that already. So if I go through and edit the valve here, likewise, we could take the same role and apply an instance description or a type description. But let's say I wanted to apply my own uh, <clears throat> valve tag parameter, or I wanted to apply my own uh, valve size parameter. We can enable this project data button and selecting project data, and we'll receive the second window here, at which point I can assign a new project parameter of my own. Now the benefit of doing it through Cisco for this specific valve for this specific system is that whatever parameters I apply, either through the instance description or the type descriptions and or here in the project data field, is it allows me to persist that through any version of any Revit model whatsoever, as long as I'm utilizing Cisco during the takeoff method. So if I were to go open a design model, for instance, that you guys were to send me and I apply these parameters to my valves or my pipes or fittings, 
uh, anytime that I process those particular uh, elements within your model file, even if I don't have it shared up within a shared parameter file, they will exist and start to create themselves and become tethered to your project. So let's say uh, <clears throat> we want to be able to tag uh, valve size. So in that case, like we were discussing earlier, we have the difference between is a shared project or is a uh, shared parameter or a project parameter. If I need to tag something, I do want to build it as a shared parameter file. So I'm gonna go ahead and type in valve size. And we'll say that it's gonna be a text field. Uh, the parameter grouping area is specifically where I want this thing to be listed in my property uh, list. So you'll see here I've got phasing, insulation. That is just where I would like to group that particular data field. Since I'm doing this on a valve through Cisco, it inherently knows that the category associated to this particular valve or any valve for that nature from Cisco is going to be considered a pipe accessory category. So we'll go ahead and hit, hit OK. And as I close this out, now when I select the add more option, I have the ability to select any of the project parameters that are coming from other Cisco options. In this case, here is our valve size. So I can select that. Now inherently, obviously we see that in the product list here, I've got uh, other options other than one size of this valve. So it goes from two to I believe 12 inch. So if I need to make a specific size per size range, I wanna go ahead and uncheck this box. And by unchecking the for all sizes checkbox, it allows me to enter an independent value per, uh, per size of this valve. So for instance, I could say <clears throat> 2.5 inch, I could say three inch, four inch, and so forth. Now the one nice thing about this is you'll see at the bottom as I'm filling this information out, we have the ability to go ahead and say, uh, export this table or import this table, uh, which is the add option. So what you would want to do preemptively if we're trying to do size specific things, um, it could be things like cost code, uh, it could be valve size in this particular instance, uh, any sort of custom data field that you wanted to apply for a range of sizes, I could actually export out the size template, fill it out preemptively, and then in any instance that I wanted to do this, maybe perhaps for the additional valve next to it, the other butterfly valve, but wafer by wafer, or if I wanted to do this for a ball valve, um, I could then add <clears throat> the table from Excel where all of this stuff was already pre-populated by importing from Excel. So now I'll go ahead and add this to the table and then close. And what I want to do here is make sure that I hit save and OK. Okay. So likewise, I could either update all existing valves or if I take off a new valve particularly, just clicking, placing, letting it process, What I will have associated to this new valve is that particular parameter value that we just created. So we decided to move it down here underneath identity data, and there's my valve size. Now, the reason why I chose valve size particularly is because a lot of guys transitioning from CAD, uh, specifically my background in fabrication, is you used to be able to do what Revit would consider a multi-category schedule. In a multi-category schedule, you have the ability to report on any model element and for most parameter values. What I've noticed specifically for fabrication-related or even purchasing uh, schedule types within uh, Revit is that not all of those options are available to you in a baseline multi-category schedule. So specifically, if we were to try to go in and right-click, create a new schedule quantity, and leave it as multi-category, we'll see as I scroll down here, that size is not an available option, which would be a very important thing for a multitude of instances, pipes, fittings, accessories. Um, so valve size, now that I've created it, is an option. So we could report that value. So in the event that you guys are trying to do an overall bill of material using a utilizing a multi-category schedule, obviously uh, it would re require some input manually for each fitting and each size for a given system. The, the, uh, the nice part about it is once it's complete, it is complete for that system for eternity. So all of your multi-category schedules would continuously uh, pursue the values that you have applied uh, to the model elements in a given system. Now for me personally, I still don't like multi-category schedules. So I've moved forward and, and, just, and I've, I've kind of come to terms with using individual model category schedules. So what we'll do is we'll go ahead and kind of construct a couple of these. So specifically, the first one that I kind of want to set up here is we'll do a, just a material cut list for pipe. 
So the way to create a new schedule is either by right-clicking Schedule Quantities, New Schedule Quantities, or you can access this from the View tab, Schedules, Schedule Quantities. So the first one we're going to do is going to be a pipe category base. So we'll go down to our pipe section and we'll hit OK. When you open up the actual schedule property editor, the first thing you're presented is the field options. Now these are the reporting objects. So everything to the left is what I can actively report on currently that is a property parameter that's loaded to the job. So specifically, we'll have your common things like type. So this would be your baseline, your original. We also have the alternate description fields that we just created earlier. So I'll go ahead and add one of those. Now, if I'm doing a cut list particularly, I want to be able to know how many of a given size and length that I have. So we'll do count. We'll go ahead and go through and say size next. And since we're doing pipe, we need to understand how what the length is. And then specifically, since I have some welded pipe and maybe I'm doing a hybrid system with Cisco, so maybe we're doing a weld by Vic option, I need to know at least what connector name one and two are. Okay. Other things I could add here particularly, Long term might be something like spool tag. So I need to know which spool that particular piece of pipe is on. Um, and let's see what else we might want to do. Let's see what we got there. So we're going to hit OK. So what we'll see here, starting off, the difference is in the column A and B, this is what natively comes from Revit using Cisco out of the box. So we have a carbon steel butt weld weld bin. That's, that's understood. That's fine that it's a welded piece of pipe. But if I'm trying to provide this to a vendor uh, for purchasing, I need to know what types of pipe and what schedule at least. Uh, so for this particular instance, the alternate description field that we went ahead and created earlier is actually set up to propagate that. Now, obviously, we see some blanks here because I did not fill that information out for the copper pipes. So if I went back through on the back end and I associated maybe type L copper from Mueller, um, or if I didn't want to be specific about manufacturer, type L or type K copper uh, to my alternate description, I could then utilize this particular field uh, moving forward. Um, right now, we're not organizing by any method. So you see we're hopping from six to four inch. And then we have our link parameters. And then we have all of our connector names, one and two. And then lastly, as we get over here, we see that I have a property option for spool tag. So I have some pipes that have been spooled and some pipes that have not. <clears throat> so particularly to that point, we can start to organize this data however we want. So perhaps we want to organize by spool. So if we want to go to sorting and grouping, we could say let's sort by spool tag. And then we want to organize by type. Um, just because I haven't filled out all the copper stuff, if I organize by uh, my alternate description field here, particularly we'd have A53 and then a bunch of blanks. So I'm organizing by type because that's pre-mandated by Revit. And then perhaps we want to organize by size so that then all of our links are grouped together. So I can hit OK there. So what it's doing is in an ascending fashion, um, we've got all of our blanks, all the pipes that haven't been spooled, and then we're organizing by all the pipes that have been spooled. So these are all of our individual cuts and then organized by size and by length. Now for me personally, I don't wanna hand my guy in the shop this long of a cut list uh, without any sort of organization. So if I am trying to properly organize by spool, I'll do a couple of different things. So if we go back to sorting and grouping within our properties palette here, we'll see that we can do a header and then we can do a blank line for spool tag particularly. And then if I want all my uh, actual spool pieces up top, we will do it in a descending fashion. So I'll hit OK. And then you'll see that we start to break the schedule out by spool. So here's all of our uh, hot water supply four for level two pipes, our individual one for three on level two, two, and so forth. Now, eventually, if I'm organizing by this data field particularly, I may want to go in and, and, and actually hide this column because now I'm having duplicate information. I'm tabling by this data. I'm also pr providing that input there on the cell information. So I may want, not want to do that. So we can go ahead and say hide columns from right clicking. Or we have the ability to go through and underneath formatting, we can actually select this option and say hidden field or not. So similar to if you guys are used to coming over from fabrication, um, you have the ability to use a particular parameter or option field to sort or filter by, but you, you don't necessarily have to actually print that on the actual report itself. Okay. 
So another th additional thing that I want to do with this <clears throat> is oftentimes I've gotten asked the question on the, uh, out on sites with different types of trainings is, how do I provide to my guy in the shop that this is actually going to be a trimmed field length? So something that needs to have maybe an additional six inches and a rounded value because we're making a run out to a piece of equipment. So in order to do this, <clears throat> what I've gone ahead and, and done preemptively is I've set up a new project parameter specifically called field trim. Now, if I go modify that to kind of show you guys for the recording, all that it is, it's a project parameter. So you can see it can appear in schedules, but not in tags. So there's our difference we were discussing earlier. It is a text field called field trim. And specifically, I've issued it to be a yes, no checkbox. And all it is reflecting categorically is going to be our pipes category. So since I've already got that built, <clears throat> I'm going to go ahead and go through and access our field trim option. Now what I want to do is add two additional parameters. So I need to take length, and I need to be able to round this. This is the printed report of Revit. This is the actual true pipe length. So if I wanted to make this pipe length longer, I would have to physically do that in the model, which is not necessarily what I want to do. I want to take this parameter and do some calculations about it. So what we can do here is add a calculated parameter against length. So I have length selected, and I'm doing this function command. Now what I need to do is give it a name. So I'm going to give it a name of a rounded length. And I'm going to go through and select our type. And we're going to change this to be a length parameter. And specifically, what the formula is going to be <clears throat> is going to be round up. So we're rounding the length field. Rounding length divide by 0 foot 1 inch. Now what that gets us is down to a decimal inch. And we're going to times back up, zero foot one inch. This time we're going to add six inches to that overall value. So we're going to hit OK. Now I need one more additional parameter field that we're going to use a calculation that says if field trim is a checkbox, we're going to take uh, the rounded length value and that will be the print object. If it is unchecked, meaning it is actually a down to a 30 second of an inch, this is how long I intend this pipe to be use the natural length built by Revit. So again, with length selected, we're gonna go through and do another calculation parameter, and we'll call this overall length. Again, it is also going to be a, um, a length parameter. So we're gonna say if, open parentheses, field trim, use rounded length. Else, use regular length. And we'll hit okay. So now if I accept this, just to kind of see what our work is, and actually I'm going to go through and I'm going to itemize and I'm going to get rid of this tabling effect that we've got going on here. <clears throat> now we're back to brass tacks. <clears throat> and let's get rid of all of our sort orders here. And itemize. So what we'll see here is we've got a 15, 8, and 7 eighths. That's the true value from Revit. If I scroll on over in this particular option, we'll see there are two math fields. So long term, we're actually going to wind up hiding E and I. And J is going to be our only object. So if it is unchecked, right now we're telling column J to utilize the actual natural length of Revit. When this box is checked, we're telling it to utilize the rounded length, which is taking the 15, 8, and 7 eighths, adding 6 inches to it, and surrounding it to the nearest whole number. So what we'll go ahead and do now is we'll hide length. Again, because I'm doing math against it, I can't delete these columns. I just need them to not be present. And in order to make this a bit better looking, I'm going to go to fields, and we're going to move overall length and field trim a bit further up the list. So we'll move them up next to size. How about that? And OK. So now as I check the box, this could be on my spool level. This could be here in the cut list. In either objective, field trim is a property that's associated specifically to the pipe in the model. So if I have it actually onto a spool sheet and I go and I tell a specific piece to have an extended field trim, it will go ahead and utilize that for all schedules, so long as we're using the same properties of these rounded values in those schedule types. So an additional thing that I want to do is I want to be able to visually indicate a bit better to my guys that are cutting this that this needs to be cut longer. 
So I want to actually colorize. I'm going to do what Revit calls a conditional format to this particular parameter of overall length. So in doing so, we're actually going to go back to formatting. We're going to find our overall length parameter, and we're going to do what's called a conditional format. So this conditional format says, for this particular parameter in this printed cell, if field trim is equal to yes, so if the box is checked, please colorize this, and we'll do red and maybe do it at kind of a, a halftone effect. So that as these boxes are checked, you'll see that they kind of stand out a bit more, indicating that they're not true cuts, that you're, you're allowing for an additional field, field trim uh, length. Okay. So another thing we might want to do is organize our overall uh, bill of materials, perhaps by level. So another thing in a category schedule that we do not have the ability to do is actually report level. So I've started to open up a, a bit of what's called Pandora's box with Dynamo. I've been teaching myself a little bit of Dynamo scripting as of late. So what I've got actually set, set up in this project is a parameter called test level. And I'm going to go ahead and add that actually to my list here. So test level. All that test level is, and I'll go back and I'll show you, it is a project parameter that I've constructed. <clears throat> and test level happens to just be a text field. And specifically, it's an instance because I need this to be able to change. I can't have my carbon steel type have the same level across the entire board. So we're going to have the same type of pipe on multiple levels. And I need it to report as such. Um, specifically test level, I've gone ahead and I've associated it specifically to pipe accessories, pipe fittings, and pipes. Because the script that I've constructed for Dynamo, and I will actually get, uh, show you guys the script, uh, is going to actually pull the reference level from all my model elements. And this could go for the same in the, the script that I've constructed. It works for all electrical components, mechanical equipment, and ductwork. So in a full uh, actual process, if I was responsible for duct and uh, electrical as well, I would just include it for duct fittings, duct accessories, and ducts. I could as well go ahead and enable it as, uh, for mechanical equipment uh, and further on down the road. But for now, we'll just do it to associate it to pipe. So we'll hit OK and OK. And now currently it is blank. So it would be up to me to go into a 3D model and select these things by level. So what I wanted to do is speed this process up because I could screw this up. If I have things hidden, turn on an invisibility, if I'm going floor plan by floor plan even, if I'm in one dash mech, I could accidentally not have something selected. So what I want uh, Revit to do is internally with a Dynamo script, take all of the values of what is reference level currently associated to this piece of pipe. And I wanted to be able to manipulate that and have it forcefully fill test level here. <clears throat> so I've got this Dynamo player, and I'll show you guys the script after it's complete. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and run our script. And what we'll see here in the background is it's going to go ahead and populate all these fields for us. Okay. So as a point of comparison, I can go select something from level four, for instance and say highlight and model. I want to go take a look at this piece of pipe. This is also another very valuable tool. So if you're trying to figure out how to manage uh, this entire design model uh, and construction model in, in, in a, uh, a reasonable format, scheduling is actually how I go about it. So I'll build schedules specifically to filter to material types, or I could filter by test level. I could say, show me only in this report all the associated pipe to level four. And then I could highlight specific things within the model. So it found a view, and here is our reference level of level four, and there's my data dump of level four. Now understanding with this particular Dynamo script, this is a one-time run. You can use Dynamo uh, functionality in order to have it automate and keep it running in the background where it's a consistent running script. Um, as far as showing you the script overall, we can go back to manage. I can open up Dynamo here and showcase kind of what I've done. Um, open, whoops, uh, test parameter. Okay. So what you'll see here is I've just got a wall and it's a pretty uh, concurrent thing. It's going categorically down the line. 
So specifically, if I wanted to get down to our uh, pipe level, we can see that it's looking at all categories of pipes within my model. It is looking at reference level. So specifically on any system straight family, this goes for conduit, cable tray, this goes for ducts, this goes for pipes, any straight system family is the code block you're looking for when you're building a script is called reference level. Any of the accessories and or fittings of either of those straight categories will be referencing to level, which you'll see up above here. So what I'm telling it to do is go grab all of those categories and take reference level and dump it, dump it to my code block of test level. Now this would be something that you guys can manipulate and it could be you know, your company level, it could be Cisco level, it could be whatever you, you guys would like to utilize. And it's gonna write that and we'll see that it's reflecting on all 93 pipes in my job currently and it was able to parlay all those over. Now these other points of failures that I have is because I've, I've got some things that are not set up within my job currently. So it is something I'm still working on actively. Um, <clears throat> and basically it found some other pipe accessories that were null in value, but it did find the valves that I had. So I've got the Nibco ductile iron butterfly valves, and I've got the Nibco 595Y. Okay, so if we take this to a our 3D view once more, and we go look at, say, one of our accessories here, we've got test level set to level two based on the original level, uh, the origin level of Revit from level two, and likewise with our fittings. So fittings reference level is level two, and my text dump here is set to level two. So there's some pretty powerful things that you can get and utilize uh, in an automation process out, 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 out of Dynamo directly. Um, <clears throat> so a couple of other schedule types we might want to utilize. Um, specifically could be uh, a duct schedule. So I had some duct here that I've modeled out and I'd sent some of it direct to download. So what I've gone through here is I've kind of preemptively set up a duct fitting schedule. And all that I'm reporting on are your pretty basic parameters. So coming from Cisco, duct material is what you would want to utilize in reference to your actual material for duct. The standard material parameter, and I'll scroll down our type parameters here, um, material, this will be the straight duct reference. So straight ducts is regular material, fitting uh, elements are gonna be duct material. Gauge will be shared across the board. And I'm utilizing family. Again, we could have done alternate description for the duct that I had modeled, and I could have set it out to follow suit with that. Then I'm just using standard size and specification name. Now what I've done here is I've added pack status. So one thing that is available to pack as you release is the ability, and it's, autom it's an automated check by default, uh, to include pack status with download. So as you send these things out, all of your fittings, accessories, and straights that you're sending through pack are going to get this processed on tag. <clears throat> so you can see that I had some stuff sent out today in the two different jobs that it went on. Likewise, I can go through the process of setting up sorting and grouping, and I could say organize by pack status first, and I could say let's provide a header and a blank line for that so that we start to group these things out. So you can start to really utilize an overall bill of material perspective for what has or what hasn't been sent out to pack. Uh, the same rules would apply for your pipe schedule. Right? So if we're back here and we're trying to utilize what's been sent out for spooling, we saw that we had a bunch of blanks. So I could set it up in such a way that it actually highlights in a conditional format things that I have not yet spooled. And that could be both for, pit, for, for fittings and for pipe. Um, another one that's pretty useful is generic content. Okay, so I've got some generic content that I left modeled out here in space on my first floor, um, specifically Cisco. So I've gone through the process of converting it to Cisco, but I've left these I generics in place. So the, th the theory of this schedule, kind of constructing of it, would be I need to be able to isolate a fitting uh, or an accessory list down to only showcase I underscore elbows or I underscore T's, I underscore pipe spuds, um, whatever those things may be, so that I can see where points of failure were in my model that Cisco didn't convert. You know, so we're not missing a, you know, an expensive valve, we're not missing an expensive fitting if we're doing, say, copper, for instance. So what we'll do is we'll create a new scheduler quantity. We'll specify this to pipe fittings. We'll hit OK. And what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to leave it to report on family. Another thing that I'm going to add is product description, and we'll showcase why. Okay. 
So if I look at this laundry list of fittings, we'll see that product description will be populated by any field where things were actually correctly processed. The three fittings that were not processed, however, are blank. So what we can set up is a filter against product description that says filter out things that do not contain or that contain does not contain blanks. So now in one foul swoop, I've taken all of what I had 60 some odd different fittings there. I'm now only reporting on things that are uh, not populated. So this would be a product description would not be populated for any of our generic components. This would be useful in perspectives of say, uh, converting a design model would be a great example. So if, for those of you that are lucky enough to start receiving these design models and you're converting them, uh, where points of failure were. Or if you're modeling Cisco from scratch and you're drawing over an underlay, um, having the ability to see where we had maybe two long radiuses that were rather tight and one of them were, were not able to convert. And then from this perspective, I just do a hunt order. So I go one by one, we'd say highlight and model, and it would take me to that view, at which point I could say, okay, let's go ahead and process that. We've got enough room now. We're going to process the actual copper T or copper elbow, I should say. And if we go back to my fitting schedule, I'm now down to two. So it's more for a quality assurance kind of quality check. And we can see now we're back down to one. <clears throat> so in my opinion, overall schedules are, are things that are, are very, very useful um, in multiple instances. So obviously being able to do a quality check against your model. Um, being able to utilize um, kind of extracurricular activities, making your own project parameters or shared parameters uh, like we had earlier in order to facilitate uh, things like your field trim, which is being able to manipulate data uh, on the back end, on the database side of things without having to physically change dimensions. Okay. So I think that takes care about um, all the things I kind of want to open up the Pandora's box to. Um, Ali, how are, we, how are we doing on questions over there? We have quite a few. Do you want to dive into some of them? Sure. Okay. So the first one is, um, will this recorded session be sent out to us? Yes. So as soon as this is recorded, it'll be a couple of days, but um, yes, we will be getting this out to you so you can refer to it. Um, there's a question about how often will these occur, and we're hoping to shoot for about once a month. We would like to, um, dependent on this is an amazing attendance. We have over 100 attendees today, so you know, as long as we're getting a lot of attendees, I think we'll just keep these going as long as we can. So now into some of the detailed questions. The first one: Is there any way to use a parameter from Cisco Bomb in the Revit schedule? Um, Kyle, what specific, um, if you could parlay, are you getting out of Cisco Bill of Materials that's not in Revit schedules? And if you're referring specifically to Harrison Pricing or MCAA Labor, um, no is currently the answer to that question. <laughs> so if you could confirm in chat. While we're waiting to see if Kyle confirms in the chat, let's go to the next one. In, in your Dynamo script for test level, can you make it so it knows if the reference level is referencing the incorrect reference level? So the way that my Dynamo script works, um, is specifically the way that I geared it, is that it is drawing based on the, the reference level that it was drawn with. So the only instance that you should run into problems, because you typically will not draw in a 3D view, right? So you'll be floor by floor. When you draw in, if I go to say level two mech here, and I draw a stick of pipe, if I draw in PI, and this doesn't have to be Cisco, you can see it's automated to reference level two. Or if I go to reference level three, and I draw in PI, that's the full automation there. So specifically the only instance I could think of that you could actually screw up here, and it's not really your fault, is if you're drawing a riser. So what you'll notice, and I'm sure you guys have seen this in your jobs, if I draw a direct riser here, and I start from level one at nine foot center line, it's two inches, and I change this and I go up to say 60 feet, and I hit apply, apply. <clears throat> now we go to our 3D view, and I should have a 60 foot riser in here. 
this particular piece of pipe is reporting from reference level one because the origin started in level one. Um, now, obviously, we could go through and we could break this apart by adding couplings along the way. Um, so I could go to my copper tab. And sorry, I've got this thing I need to get out of the way. Uh, so if I added a stop coupling here, you know, periodically, I could change manually now where these things are referenced from because they're two individual pipe elements. So I could leave this one on level one and say, all right, we've got 16 foot floors. I got pretty darn close there. That's awesome. <laughs> um, so then we change the reference level two for this pipe, and then we change the reference level to three for this pipe, or so forth. Then all I would need to do is rerun my script. So if I do that for these particular parts, we come back in and say run again. Actually, I don't know how to do that. Let me go back and rerun it from here. Oh, I have Dynamo open. Um, where did Dynamo go? There you are. Oh, sorry, guys. No. So rerun. So you can see there it's automatically updated. So that would be my only, uh, I guess, cause, cause for concern would be risers with the script the, the way that I've constructed it. Because it's only taking in, there is no, the only ability would be if I screwed up the reference level initially. Yep. Okay. Um, do schedules work with total lengths of pipe or duct? Sometimes for ordering purposes, it would be easier to get a total number length of each size. That is a great point. Um, that's a schedule I planned on constructing and I didn't. So here's how easy this is. So we'll build a brand new pipe schedule. Uh, let me type in pipes here. So we'll do alternate description. Actually, we'll, we won't again, because I didn't do the copper earlier. So let's do type. Then we need to know size, if nothing else. And we need to know length. So without getting other additional stuff, we could do the test level thing if we wanted to organize by level. But again, if this is just for a procurement of total material, these are likely the only three categories that we need. So what we need to do <clears throat> is I need to sorting and grouping, organize by type, then by size, then by length. And with that, we're going to not itemize every instance. And what you'll notice is when I hit OK, it's not really grouping everything together. Okay. So um, we're going to take off length from our sort. And now I have a bunch of blank fields. Now, what's very important about Revit is when you have conflicting data, meaning that each one of these six inch pipes or four inch pipes had differing length values, some of them the same, some of them not. What I need to be able to do now to make those not conflict is go to formatting, go to length, and then I need to set calculate totals as a function. So now in this total job, I have at four inch of carbon steel pipe, 223 feet, uh, eight and seven eighths. And if I want to get quirky and round it, because we're not going to order an eight and seven eighths inch pipe, right? So we're going to go to formatting. We're going to go back to length, and we'll set up a field format to ignore the project units, which are currently rounding to a 30 second inch. So we're going to say round to the nearest whole inch and go up. There we go. Or we could round to the nearest foot, for that matter, uh, however you guys want to delineate that. Somebody raised a hand, I think, so I need to figure out how, but it went down again. Maybe it was an accident. Anyway, um, is Dynamo the only way to pull in the level information? Um, so the only other option that you have for native uh, level information, mechanical equipment is a category schedule that will report level natively. Air terminals are another schedule that will report natively. The only alternative function for categories such as pipes, fittings, and pipe accessories, you would have to use a multi-category schedule. So if I go back through and I construct a multi-category schedule, leaving just that part selected, and I hit OK, what you'll see here is you have all the typical category functions, most of them. Um, again, going back to my, my conversation earlier, it doesn't have all the pertinent fields that you would need. So you would have to maybe utilize the project data option that we showed earlier in the recording. Um, You'll notice that level is here, 
level is also here. And with multi-categories, which ni is nice, is you can actually specify down to rooms. So if the architect has actually constructed rooms correctly, and you've gone through the process of maybe doing um, copy monitor and then space naming, you could do spaces. So rooms are for architects, spaces are typically for MEP engineers. And in that, you could report out uh, space name uh, and space number along with level. Now in this project, I have no uh, spaces set up. It was just a blank mechanical template. But if I add all three, and then maybe I'll throw over type um, and hit OK, you'll see this is everything in the job. So we've got some things that haven't associated the level uh, and some things that have. So pipes and fittings and, for the most part, accessories have those. But even then, the intermittency of this and why these particular things are not receiving a level association, um, primarily because, again, pipes is reference level, not level. And fittings are set up and accessories are set up to follow level. Uh, I would want to find out if reference level was an, was an option here in my multi-category. So let's check that out real quick. Um, reference level is not an option here. So for my straights, I'm kind of out of luck there. Okay. All righty. Uh, Fran has a question. When we use the field trim parameter, is it possible to change one end prep to plain end? Um, that would be a manual process and or could be done through Dynamo. Now, I'm again, I'm pretty green to Dynamo myself. I've been trying to challenge myself to get better at it. Um, and in doing that, I created that parameter, uh, that, that, uh, the Dynamo script. However, um, the way that we would have to go about it would be a, a manual option. So we'll say, if I wanted to field trim this piece of pipe that I have in the background, um, we'll add field trim. And then I would have to make sure that I go through and say, you know, raw or plain. Um, actually, solder is probably a bad example. So we could go through here, and I could say plain end. Make sure that this box is checked. And then what we would have additional to that is we could set up another um, conditional statement. So if I have plain end set to a piece of pipe, for instance. So we'll go back to formatting. We'll say, since I only assigned it to connector one, I would have to be careful, um, or I'd have to set up an option for both if either of these fields have plain end assigned. So we'll go to connector one, conditional format. If connector one is equal to plain end, cap specific, Revit's pretty anal about that, colorize this in you know a similar red tone. So that as I go through and say, all right, these, uh, this one's plain end, and this one's plain end, and these two need to make sure our option is checked for field trim. So ultimately, Dynamo would be something that could resolve that for you. It could look at things that, you know, if field trim is enabled for a given piece of pipe, make connector one plain end. Because again, we don't, we don't typically care what connector one or two is um, if we're doing a field trip, right? Okay. All righty, Jeff has a question. How do you get the pack status export name? So pack status <clears throat> is going to be, let's go back to my 3D view here. If I open up pack, What pack is going to read by default, again, this it, verify that this box is checked. It should be checked by default. But we want to add job information to process tag. What it's going to tag is the date and this, whatever you have set up for these. Now, again, as far as the orientation of these, we just put job number, level floor, and system out there for kind of examples of what to populate this with. I don't care what you utilize. It's just saying the file is going to be something dash something dash something. Um, when you confirm and actually send this material, you have to go through the full download process. You can't just get it to this window and then apply that stuff. Uh, once it's sent full ways, pack status will be an objective parameter here that will showcase that. And that will just happen automatically.
And that is a shared parameter that can be utilized in any of your schedules for ducts, fittings, or duct accessories if you guys cut your own uh, inline volume dampers. Okay. okay. Um, Derek has two questions, or one, and then um, he had an example. Okay. So if you have any kind of document that shows how to set up a calculated value for the schedules, i.e. the formulas that we would need to use? Uh, we do not. Um, what I will talk with Ali about is m making sure I can uh, validate the uh, consistency of the Dynamo script, and maybe we can publish it. Um, okay. But that'll be that'll be for a future discussion. Um, but yes, right now, as of any sort of recommended calculations or recommended schedules, the only schedules that we have for you guys to utilize out of the gates, which will not have the test level option or the field trim option, uh, is going to be underneath your C drive. We have a demo template, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with. Um, but it does have a nice starter kit for fabrication schedules specifically. Um, if we're trying to do a fabrication spool schedule, for instance, um, we have in this Cisco MEP Imperial demo template, which I'll go ahead and open. Maybe. There we go. Um, we do have some schedules pre-built. So if we look at this guy, you can see we have quite a few of them. For electrical ducts, we've got a, a decent hanger, hanger schedule. The only recommendation I would make to this is we're missing one very important one, which is rod diameter. Um, that is easy enough to go add, though. Um, it just never it never got added. Um, since I haven't introduced hangers to this model as of yet, rod, rod diameter is not an option here. But as soon as you place hangers, that is a, a shared parameter that gets loaded, at which point you could utilize it, uh, particularly for that schedule. Um, but here's an overall cut list. And then, so whoever's earlier question was, do you have an overall linear schedule? Um, we have, this one's messed up, and I think it might be my file. Yeah, I filtered the classification. So if I set no filters, this is every single cut by size by overall length for the job. So this would be a decent starter. Um, again, for the uh, default spool schedules, uh, we've got them preset for the two parameters that are required for spooling to function as far as a schedule purpose, which are spool tag and piece number. These are preemptively set up and they have a nice picture. Uh, if you want to steal these and make them your own, it's as easy as selecting all the schedules, copy to clipboard, going over to your other project that exists. So I'll go back to the one I was playing with earlier, doing a modify, paste from clipboard. And then I'll have all of these schedules now just kind of inherently working because they all share the same parameter information, right? Okay. Um, some of these show eight um, to 10, 13, 32 inch, for instance. How do you round up to 1 16th of an inch? Correct, okay. So we have two options, either at the schedule level, we did cover this kind of a, uh, a second ago. If we want our model to consistently round to a 32nd of an inch, but we want a schedule to report separately, we would go to that particular formatting and say length, field format specifically for don't use project settings for this parameter within this schedule, round to the nearest whatever. So we could round to the nearest inch if I wanted to. If I need that to happen at a global scale, which means that any new schedule I generate from this point forward, that's gonna be beneath manage project units and then you have length here, which is currently rounding to a 32nd. So I'd round this to a 16th or an eighth. And then any new schedule that I created, you can see that it, we're rounding to, oh, this is the one I overwrote. Um, both of these overwrote. So, <coughs> excuse me, I'm just gonna force um, my overall length to follow. Oh, never mind. it is falling to an eighth. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah, sorry. It's Monday. I was seeing I was seeing a sixteenth, but I actually wasn't. So yeah, you have two options. Cool, thank you. Um, how well do the schedules work for electrical fitting and conduit? Um, so let's see. I think Judy has propagated some in oh, our. We have an actual electrical template um, wherein she's actually got a lot of this stuff already set up. And everyone who has. Um, upgraded or if you're on the latest Cisco, you will have you should have this in your in this um, location. So can you slow down and show that location where the template files are? 
Yep. So under program data, building data support, 2018 template files. I just want to make sure I had it first. Within this directory, you will have an I electrical Cisco template 2018. And so if I open this guy and open up our schedules here, we'll do conduit run. So she's got it set up by trade size. Uh, she's got conduit tags. So as you're starting to set up the, the actual circuiting between um, your equipment uh, to different fixture types, you know, be it uh, receptacles or J boxes, uh, those things will come over. And she's also got it preemptively set up to associate to a spool tag. So as you start to spool this, it will show you which spool it's a part of and then which piece number is associated on that spool. Um, but yeah, she's got a few different ones. She's got some electrical circuit schedules, conduit strut racks. Um, so as you're going through the hanging process, um, similar to our hanger schedule that we have on the piping side, this one's set up for the electrical. Um, and then we're overall conduit schedule. Uh, she's got things even marked out to top and bottom elevation, which is gonna be pretty pretty useful for you. Okay, we're getting close to the hour, so I'm going to do one more, and then um, any questions that we did not get to, we will just an we'll, um, send answers or references of where you can find the information when we send out the recording. Okay, so the last one, the Revit reference level is not always correct. Do you have a fix for this? Um, so if the Revit reference level is not always correct, you can manually change it. Um, I'm not sure in what instance it would not be correct, uh, to be quite honest with you, unless, again, we drew based on a difference, different reference level accidentally in a 3D view or something, um, at which point, if I get back to a model that's got some pipe, it's as easy as selecting an object and changing its reference level manually. What you'll notice is that don't be frightened by this. Nothing changes physically about the model element. The only thing that changes because Revit's elevation is by default a reference uh, to a given level within the project, it's just saying that the readout is now 19 foot from level two, or if I go to level four, it's negative one foot center line. So by changing this in conjunction with that script that we had earlier, uh, we would have the ability to update to the correct reference level of your choice. All righty, it's 10 o'clock in, in the Denver area. So we thank you all for spending time with us this morning. Um, all questions, again, that weren't able to be answered, we will get those answered as well as the recording sent out to all of you. Thank you very much for attending. Yep, thanks, guys.